branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. I need to apologize to you, though. I have a kind of a tail end of a cold, so I'm a little croaky. And I'm not going to be real friendly with you and shake your hand and share my germs with you at the end of the service. That's the bad news. The good news is we discovered this morning when you don't shake hands when people go out, you get out of here in about you know, half the time. <laughs> so you have that to look forward to. But it's, it's always great to be here. And as you know, when I, when I visit churches, I, I always want to thank the, the clergy for the great job they're doing caring for you. And that's especially the case here at St. Barnabas where you're doing so many creative and, and interesting things. Um, Jim's not here today. As you know, he's doing a, a retreat today. But this would be a good occasion to thank the other clergy members of the staff and give them a big hand of applause for Erica and Nick and Elizabeth and <laughs> Phil. And... Well, these days, if you go to the grocery store, you have a choice. You can buy eggs or you can buy organic eggs, a loaf of bread or organic bread a gallon of milk or organic milk. Now there's some debate over what organic really means, but it certainly implies that the product is natural with no additives, growth hormones, or artificial fertilizers. Organic farming is a multi-billion dollar industry. It accounts for 5% of all the food we eat. And the demand is increasing all the time even though those products will cost you more at the store. In our gospel, we hear Jesus use an organic metaphor. He's always telling his disciples earthy stories that come from the agricultural world of his listeners. And this is an especially important one. Jesus takes an object that is familiar to farmers, the vine, and he turns it into a symbol of discipleship. Jesus calls us to be organic Christians, rooted, growing, fruitful, without any man-made additives, genuine and natural, and with a limited amount of the fertilizer known as BS. The image of a vine would have been familiar to his listeners, of course. The image of the vine is used in many places in the Old Testament to describe the people of Israel. Sometimes God is described as the vineyard owner. Sometimes religious leaders are reminded to tend the vine of faith 
that God has planted. The vine is also a great symbol for the church. One megachurch calls itself the vineyard. If you look around in most churches, you will usually see some vines incorporated into the art of the, the building. You've got some up here in your kneelers and some over there in the ombre. And just in case you forgot what one looks like, I brought one from my garden. <laughs> so how come a vine? Well, a vine, of course, is a fast-growing plant. You can't tell the branches apart. You can't tell where the trunk stops and the branches begin. There's no room for rugged individualism here. Jesus tells us that as members of his body, we are intertwined, meshed together, and we're here for one common purpose, and that is to bear fruit. Well, what does Jesus mean by fruit? He likes that word. The word fruit appears 55 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's equated with good works. Sometimes it means caring for the poor. But it's often used to describe increase in numbers. Converts are the fruit of discipleship. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians calls converts the first fruits of the gospel. And he says in Colossians that everywhere the church is growing in numbers and bearing fruit. Well, think about it. Fruit's pretty, uh, pretty attractive. I mean, who wouldn't, doesn't want fruit? Who would, who, who would not like to eat grapes or drink wine? I mean, nobody wants the plate of crudités, right? We always going to go for the fruit salad. So the question that the gospel raises is this. Have we, as a church, as the Episcopal Church, have we been producing fruit? The latest statistics came in this week from the National Church, and I'm afraid that it's bad news. Far from producing fruit, we are, in fact, dying on the vine. The answer seems to be that for the last 30 years or so, the Episcopal Church has been gradually shrinking. And in fact, if this trend continues, there won't be an Episcopal Church left in two more generations. Well, this is my biggest worry as a bishop, and anybody who's in church leadership shares that with me. We have an aging and shrinking church. And you may not believe that when you look around at a wonderful congregation like this at St. Barnabas, and you are, in fact, one of the flagships of the Diocese of Arizona. But the fact is that I was a member of this church when I was growing up. In 1976, I remember being here, and you're just about the same size or a little smaller than you were then. And think how much bigger Scottsdale is since 1976. Unless we become more fruitful in converts, we are like those branches that Jesus talks about, ready to be cut off and burned. God gives no guarantees to the Episcopal Church. If we don't produce, God will find another vineyard to work in. Now this would be pretty depressing news for a warm summer Sunday morning if it were not for the next part of the reading. Because Jesus also gives us the secret or the key to being healthy, fruit-producing vines. And the key word is abide. Abide. Just as the branches have to be attached to the vine, so we have to be connected to Jesus. We must abide with Jesus, hang out with Jesus. That's what good discipleship is all about. Well, how do we do that? What does abiding look like? Now, that word abiding might at first strike us as a sort of an old-fashioned word, like the hymn, you know, abide with me, fast falls the eventide. It might be helpful to know that this word 
in the Greek scriptures as meneo, which is the same root word that we get the English word remain. To abide with Jesus to, means to remain with Jesus, to hang out with Jesus, to stick close to Jesus. Well, how do we do that? Well, one way, of course, is prayer, both collectively and more importantly, individually. I remember long ago how a Sunday school teacher once asked my class, could you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and never talk to them in person, never call them on the phone? Well, of course you couldn't. And it's the same with God. How can we have a relationship with God if we never talk or we never listen? And of course we have to make time to do that, don't we? So here's a question. How much time each day do you spend talking with your spouse or your friend or your partner or your child? How much time do you spend talking or listening to God? Another way to be with Jesus is through Scripture. Sad to say, Episcopalians are not noted for their knowledge of the Bible. We tend to dismiss Bible study as something only fundamentalists do. But one of our own theologians, Dallas Willard, reminds us that even doing something as simple as knowing a few Bible verses by heart can support us in those times that we're in trouble and when God seems far away. So, if you are on Jeopardy and had to select Bible for 200, how many questions do you think you'd get right? On a deeper level, though, engagement with the Bible is not just memorization or deep study. It's prayerful and relational engagement. Finding your own story in the story of God's people and in the story of Jesus. We make the mistake of thinking that Bible study is something for the head when it has much more to do with our hearts. And let's not forget that Jesus also gave us the gift of those people who are around us, the fellowship of the church. Well, to be honest, sometimes we look at those people sitting around us in church and we think, the body of Christ? You've got to be kidding. I don't even like that person. Let's not forget that the word church in the Bible is ecclesia, and that literally means those people who have been drafted. You're not here because you want to be here. You're here because God wants you to be here. You have been drafted. And any of you who have ever been in the armed forces know that you probably would not have chosen those people that you served with as your own personal friends. But they're the ones that were drafted to do that work with you. The community of the church is never an easy place to be in. It's got a lot of problems. It would be simpler if we could just sit at home and watch a televangelist on television. But the church is a kind of laboratory of love, the place that we live out our spirituality. The early father of the church, Tertullian, wrote, that one Christian is no Christian. You can't be connected with Christ. You can't abide in Christ unless you are connected with Christ's body, the church. And let's not forget that in the gospel today, Jesus, when he compares us to a vine, also says that we're a vine that needs to be cultivated, a vine that needs to be pruned. Without that pruning, a vine turns into a mess. Any of you from the South, you all know what kudzo is, right? What happens with those vines? They take over everything, don't they? Complete mess. And I was surprised to find out that the word deadhead is an agricultural term. It is not really a member or a follower of a particular rock group. <laughs> that is, in fact, a deadhead are those little buds on a, on a plant that you have to pinch off so that the rest of the plant will be more fruitful. You have to cultivate it. In a way, we in the church 
are a bunch of deadheads. Always being shaped, always being formed, always being pruned by God to produce even more fruit. Well, I believe right now we are being pruned, that the, the church is in the midst of a dramatic reshaping. We're discovering that the old ways of doing church that relied so much on structure are no longer working. The church 10 or 20 years from now will look a lot different than it does today. I'm no prophet, but I suspect that the church of the future will be a lot more organic, a lot more relational than it is now. It will have less to do with rules and regulations and chain of command, and more to do with meeting people where they are. I suspect that it will be a church in which Christian community finds many more venues to meet than on a building on Sunday morning, where mission innovation trumps institutional preservation. I suspect that it will be a church where service to neighbor will be far more important than fine points of theology. I suspect that it will be a church where people see themselves as disciples of Christ rather than members of an institution. You know, many, people, many young people these days don't even like the term Christian anymore because all of the bad connotations that word has in our culture for them. Christian for many young people means being narrow, judgmental, and bigoted. Instead, they would rather be called Christ followers. What the future of our church looks like is not clear. But what is certain is that we will only find it when we are rooted and grafted in Christ. We are called to be organic disciples, firmly planted, deeply intertwined, constantly growing, and profoundly fruitful. And we can't do that alone. Just as the branches cannot exist without the vine, and that vine is Christ. And apart from Christ, we can do nothing.